Welcome everyone to a Bit Devs LA. This is the first Bit Devs LA of 2021. I'm super excited. We've got an amazing guest, Daniela, and um, we're gonna also host a Socratic seminar after this. So stick around after the amazing presentation that I'm looking forward to. Uh, very first uh, thing though is I wanna give a huge shout out to River Financial. Uh, they've decided to continue their sponsorship for 20. Uh, through 2021 and it's i'm very very grateful for them they're going to help us keep the meetup growing and i promise you guys as soon as we can meet in person we're going to throw a rager here in la and daniela you're definitely uh invited to that all right so um welcome everyone to this room and i first off uh i would just like to introduce daniela uh she works at slush is which is a mining pool and she's working on a very very special uh, mining pool, um, I, don't, I don't know, infrastructure, I guess. And it helps like democratize Bitcoin mining and uh, the creation of blocks uh, so that it's not just the pool admins that are doing it. So Daniela, thank you for hopping on. Um, I would love it if you could just briefly introduce yourself and uh, yeah, we can get the show started. Um, thanks. So I'm Daniela, I'm 20, I'm from Italy. Uh, I'm, I'm working at the moment at Brains, which is the company who owns Slash Pool. I've worked for a little bit on Southern V2. I'm not working exactly on it at the moment, but still, I wanted to stick about it a while because, uh, a bit because it's, I don't know, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, that's basically it. I have. I have some contribu contributions on some open source projects such as Bitcoin Dev Kit, and I work a bit on blockchain, and that's just everything about me. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Do you feel ready for your presentation? Yep. We'll start speaking a little bit about mining, just to give you a general introduction. So, next. <laughs> So mining is the process of creating new blocks on the blockchain. Uh, next, uh, and it is super competitive. Uh, like uh, the performance counts really a lot, and you don't want to waste any seconds. And there's also an economic incentive to do so. Uh, so miners earn the block reward, which is at the moment it's. 6.25 bitcoins and all the fees of the transactions in the block. So what we use for mining is uh, the concept of proof of work, which is just a piece of data which is difficult to produce, but very easy for others to verify. And we're using proof of work in a kind of cool way uh, because the block hash must be lower than a certain target, which changes um every uh, 2016 blocks so what mining devices are doing is they're continuously manipulating the parameters of, of the block until a valid one is found uh, and by a valid one i mean a block which starts with a certain number of zeros and the parameters that are used uh, that are continuously changed are for example uh, the nonce, the version, the timestamp, the Coinbase transaction, and then if you want, you can shuffle the transaction list, and this will change the Merkle root of the block, but it's a bit risky and you shouldn't do so because um, uh, you might end up having an invalid block. So let's set up mining device. This is a mining device and it is very good at maths, it really likes calculating things and it spends all day looking for bad blocks. And at the moment, the most common um, mining devices are ASIC circuits. ASIC means application specific integrated circuit and it's just a circuit which is designed just for mining. So it's not like your common CPU that you use for everything. That circuit is made just for calculating hashes, and it has better performance than the normal CPUs and GPUs. So in the early days of Bitcoin, you didn't 
need a really quick start mining and you could use just your own computer and what happened is that every device was connected to its own uh, bitcoin core node and it would ask uh, to the node um, the transaction set and the previous block hash and it used different protocols for doing so the first protocol is the Gatwork protocol, and it was the first standard communication between miners and the Bitcoin protocol. Um, it wasn't really efficient. It used HTTP to connect to Bitcoin V, as every other uh, JSON RPC call in Bitcoin V. And it was quickly uh, replaced by Get Block Template, which is developed in 2012. It has its own bit with its own bits, which is the bit 22 and 23. And as I said, it's just a replacement of the get work protocol. So at a certain point, hash rates started increasing and we started to need mining pools. So a mining pool is just a chubby boy. Uh, <laughs> it is hash rate all day. And next, okay, this is this chubby monster with just our mining pool. And uh, uh, how does this mining pool work? Well, basically, the point is having various miners work together to increase the chance to find a new block. So the miners work on the block template and they need to send shares to the pool. What is a share? It's just a partial proof of work, so a block with a lower target. Uh, basically, the pool asks for a certain target, which is way lower than the network target. And each time uh, the device finds a block which is lower than that target, it sends it to the pool. This way, the pool can calculate your hash rate uh, based on how many shares you find. And when a new block is found, the pool receives the coin reward. So if you look like uh, at the Coinbase, the address is usually a pool's address, but then the pool pays the miners proportionally proportionally to their work, to their hash rate. And this reduces the payouts variance. Just think if you could find one block each year, for example, you would be paid just once each year. And the point of using a mining pool is that instead of being paid just once, you get paid more times like each day. And yeah, you just you're just reducing the variance of the payout. Okay, so that's a small drawing of how pool works in the early days. So you had various devices connected to the pool. They were exchanging uh, jobs, which are just blocks in place to work on, and shares, which, as I said, are just those blocks which are invalid for the current network target, but are valid for counting um, your hash rate. So how do they speak? They use, in 2012, they use Stratum V1, which uh, was developed by Slash, which is the creator of Slash Pool, the first mining pool. It had some flaws, like for example, the mes messages were not encrypted and, um, uh, and the miners didn't get to construct their own blocks. Uh, which meant that the pool was like the single point of failure. And if you look at this drawing, drawing the success, you will notice that uh, the pool has a lot of open connections, one for each miner. And this is obviously um, not efficient. So one thing you can use are proxies. Uh, next slide, please. So what proxy do is just they aggregate hash rate. So they reduce the connections on the server side. So the server, the pool just have to have less connections open because they don't, they can just speak with proxies. But we can still do that. In 2018, Better Hash was presented by Matt Corallo. As I said before, the one problem of V1 is that miners didn't get to construct their own blocks. And this is a proposal to allow miners to do so. The problem is it was a bit difficult to implement from the pool side. As far as I know, there are no better hash implementations. 
So what happened is that Corallo joined forces with Pavel Morales and Jan Chatek. And in November 2019, they presented certain V2, at least uh, the specification. And well, this whole presentation will be <laughs> about certain V2, so let's look at it in more detail. It's composed of four different subprotocols. The first one is the mining protocol, and it is the important one, the mandatory one. It's the only mandatory protocol. And the other three protocols are not required to be implemented. You can ignore them if you don't like them. And those are the template distribution protocol, the job negotiation protocol, and the job distribution protocol. Let's add this protocol more protocols more in detail. So the mind, as I said, that's the main protocol and the successor of V1. It's used for communicating between the devices, the proxies, and the pools, and it addresses some V1 flows, such as um, the messages were not encrypted, so uh, it prevents many the middle attacks. It reduces bandwidth consumption. Um, it uh, it supports mining channels and it mitigates the problem of anti. Am I still here? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um. So this is just a man in the middle of talk, and basically the device is speaking to the pool, but it. The messages are exchanged in plain text. So what happens is is that uh, there is this malicious third party that can sit between the pool and the device, and it can basically read all the messages. And this is a obvious privacy leak because the third party will know everything uh, about your miners and about your entry. And one thing the third party could do is a hash rate hijacking attack, which means that the third party could steal some of your shares and submit them to the pool. And if the third party steals all your shares, you're going to notice because after a couple of hours, you won't receive any payout and you will be like, hey, something strange is happening. But what if the third party just steals 1% of your shares? You won't even notice. And if you notice, you will be like, okay, my payout is a bit smaller, but maybe it's because I'm not very lucky today. So yeah, it's a very powerful attack and rarely, rarely people notice it. So what V2 does, it uses an encryption scheme. And basically all the messages are encrypted and signed. So the third party can read them or modify them. Daniela, I have a question. Yep. So I steal your shares and I claim that I'm the one that sent them. Is that what's happening with the third party? Yeah, exactly. But you still just a small part and I know I don't notice. Wow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So it reduces the bandwidth consumption. Uh, basically, V2 is completely binary instead of JSON based. The JSON protocol was was used for V1 because it's human readable, and so it was easier to debug and everything. But the problem is it's it's not very efficient. So, uh, with V2 they went completely binary, and if you look at the size of of a share submission message, you notice that in V1 it's like three times bigger than in V2. It depends if you're using encryption or not, but but still, it's really, it's really um smaller in V2. And also, V2 eliminates some redundant messages. Then V2 supports mining channels. The whole idea of mining channels is that the downstream devices are opening channels with the upstream devices. And you don't have to think of one mining channel as if it was one TCP connection, because one TCP connection can actually uh, support various mining, mining channels. So what happens is that you have just one connection 
and multiple channels for multiple devices. Stratum V2 defines three different main channels. The first type are the standard channels, um, which are the channels for the header only mining. So it's mining without touching the coin base. And it is much more efficient for end mining devices because they don't have to um, recalculate the Merkle root each time or they don't have to receive by the proxy or by the pool the, the whole Merkle path to the coin base. Then there are extended channels which are given uh, more control on what they can do and they can manipulate the coin base too and they are intended to be used by proxies. And then we have group channels which are just a collection of standard channels, basically. Now, what are empty blocks and why are, are they here? So I think it happened to everyone that you're really waiting for a transaction to be confirmed. And you just see that an empty block has just been mined and you're just like, Hey, what the fuck? Why? I, I'm sorry, I just paid fees. I really want this transaction to be included. And you really mind an empty block? Well, the reason for empty blocks is technical. And I have to say, oh, next, please. Um, I have to say that um, at the moment, there is a strong incentive to avoid mining empty blocks because the fees are like, 15% of the whole block payout. So you don't want, you don't really want to mine empty blocks. And the more the block reward decreases, the more the incentive of avoiding empty block grows. So when a new block is found, all the miners have to start to work on new block as AAP because each second is important. So the pools need to send the new job as quickly as possible. So what they do is that they initially send the block template without transactions and miners start working on it. This is because it takes um, a couple of seconds for the pool to, you know, pass the previous block. And when they have it passed, they just send the old block template with the transactions. Um, the, the fact is that if in that couple of seconds, the miner finds uh, a valid block that's empty, but you just broadcast it because whatever, it still six bitcoins, you know? So um, uh, V2 mitigates this. It separates two messages, the message containing the transactions and the message containing the prevash. So what can be done is that the pool can send the transactions before the new block is found. So the pool just starts looking into the mempool for transactions that are unlikely to be included in the next block and they send those to the miner just saying, hey, when the new block is found, when I send you the prevash, start working on this. When the new block is found, the mining pool sends the prevash, the miner starts to work immediately on the new, not empty block. And this could lead to mining in that blocks. At the moment, it doesn't really make any sense to do so because um, mining in that block, that's a problem for you because you're just going to waste like seven or eight bitcoins of reward. But maybe, you know, in 20 years when the reward is super uh, smaller, at that point, it makes sense to just every now and then mine some invalid blocks, but at least you'll get uh, the, the full transaction fees when this doesn't happen. So yeah, V2 mitigates this. Then the template distribution protocol, there's not much to say about it. It's used for getting information out of core. It replaces the get block template. It's more efficient than the new HTTP. And uh, in this case, the miners broadcast they, their own blocks, so the pool can't really censor them. So when a miner found a valid block, it just sends it instead of uh, sending it to the pool. Then the job negotiation protocol, it involves this guy. It's used by miners to just negotiate a block template with a pool. So uh, the miner asks, hey, is this block template cool? And it can um use uh, the signalic bits it wants it can choose the transactions it wants uh, 
and uh, the result of the negotiation can be used for all the mining connections. So you just do one negotiation and you use the result for all your devices. Uh, please note that the negotiation could fail. I mean, you could send to the mining pool a uh, block and it, it could, the mining pool could say, yeah, I don't really like it because I don't like that your signal doing this, for example. But at least it's more transparent, you know, because you will know if your pool doesn't want to censor some transactions or doesn't want, for example, to support taproot. So, yeah. And then the friend of the job negotiation protocol is the job distribution protocol. It's used to pass the negotiated work to the interested nodes. And usually the proxies are the ones which distribute the jobs. So let's just briefly look at a scenario with um, Stratum V2. So we have, uh, first of all, the job negotiator, which asks the Bitcoin core node for the template. And then it will just start negotiating with the pool for the block template. Once the negotiation is done, it will just distribute the template to the proxy and then the devices will start mining. So is V2 ready? Well, kind of. I mean, some parts of the protocol still lack some proper specifications. Some parts just need to be implemented. Um, most of the mining protocol is already there, but still there are some parts lacking. Square Crypto is supporting the development with grants. As far as I know, uh, one grant has been given, or maybe more, I don't remember exactly. But yeah, uh, Square Crypto is supporting V2, so let's hope that we'll have uh, a V2 version working soon. soon. I mean, full V2 version working with all the protocols. And now, what if you want to read this V2 specification? Well, I'm super sorry, but at the moment you can't. Uh, what happened is that the specification was on a Google Docs document and Google marked brains.com as dangerous because there were an executable file on, on the website. And uh, with that, it just tore down the document containing the specification, which is super sad. Uh, we already um appealed to this and um i think they're like reviewing the specification it's been a while honestly but it should come back soon it's it's not even a fun fact it's super sorry that just google decided that you didn't like v2 anymore but yeah we'll see how it goes um so what if i want to try v2 at least the parts that are already implemented it depends if you're a cool person or not. If you're super cool, you can just use Brains mining firmware. There is Brains OS, which is written in Rust and fully open source, and Brains OS Plus, which uses Brains OS as a base, but then it adds some proprietary algorithm for auto-tuning. As a pool, you should use Lush Pool because it already has a V2 endpoint. And if you want more info on BrainSource or BrainSource Plus or ISO tuning or I don't know, whatever, just check out the brains.com website. They have all the information. So what if you're not super cool? Well, you can still use V2 in some way. If you don't want to use Lush Pool, you can just use a V2 to V1 translation proxy, which means that you'll use BrainSource uh, which will speak V2 to the Stratum proxy, and then uh, the proxy will translate uh, um, translate and speak V1 to the mining pool. So yeah, th that was it. I'm super sorry it happened everything, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I did it somehow. And um, so do you have any questions? Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Um, if people have questions, they can definitely drop it in the chat and we will read it out loud to Daniela. Um, yeah. But yeah, Daniela, one, yeah, no uh, one question I had was, so the specification was stored in Google Drive and did you guys not have a copy anywhere? And so it's now gone permanently and you guys have to rewrite it? No. 
no, no, we, we had copies. Uh, otherwise, it would have been difficult to just do all these lights. The problem is it's not available to the public at the moment, but I think it will be fixed soon because there's nothing crazy in that file. It has been marked as dangerous because it's linked with brains, but Google already solved with the problem with brains.com. Uh, so I think that the V2 specification problem will be fixed too. If not, we have local copies and we'll have to publish them on GitHub or somewhere else. Awesome. Okay, so we have a question from the audience. Um, one second. Does job negotiation does job negotiation happen with every block? Yes, because um, with each block you have to uh, construct the the new block with all the transactions, and then ask to the pool, "Hey, do you like those transactions? Does this block template make sense?" So yeah, it happens with uh, every block. I had a question about the shares. Um, you said that they, they send shares that are less than the target for the difficulty. Is that so? Then does that somehow get put together to make a to make a full a full kind of entry that's that's within the difficulty? Maybe I misunderstood how that worked. Oh, you're, you're muted. Uh, I yeah. couldn't hear probably the question, but yeah, the point is that. Um, you have for something with a different target, which is just easier to find. So maybe the miner will find like uh, 100 valid shares and one valid block. But since you have 100 valid shares and maybe another miner has 200, you can pretty much say uh, the hash rate of each miner. So the whole point is that you fake as uh, if the network had a much easier difficulty and uh, you receive uh, all the shares. And then, well, most of them are just invalid blocks because they they don't have enough zeros um, at the start. But then, yeah, sometimes you will find valid blocks and you will just broadcast them. So does it, do the clients then know that they have, like for instance, if a, if a miner that's joined the pool, like they know that they hit a, they'll know at the time that they find a valid block because of the, the nonce or the, the checksum algorithm, right? Oops, you're, you're muted. Well, the pool knows the correct target for the network. So it just receives the shares. And if it finds a share which is valid because it's a valid block, it's just broadcast that. Or oh, maybe I didn't uh, get exactly the question. No, I guess I was wondering, is like from a minor point of view that, that's connected to the pool, they've basically oh, calculated. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, will the miner... Okay, now, now we see. Well, the miner, if it has to broadcast their own blocks, they have to know the current network difficulty. Otherwise, yes, they can just ignore it and just uh, work as if the network was much easier and just send everything to the pool and the pool will handle everything. Okay, okay, so the, the pools basically put it together. All right, that makes sense, I guess. Thanks. Hey, Daniela, so, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. There's a new question in the chat. You wanna go for it, Steve? Yeah, sure. So the, uh, Damien's asking, does slush pool sensor according to the OFAC blacklist? And if so, what happens if a miner includes a transaction from a censored address? I honestly don't know if Slashpool is censoring some transactions, but I can say that um, if you're using the job negotiation protocol and you include a transaction that your pool doesn't like, the pool is just going to, to tell you hey, I don't like this template, don't use it. And if you use it, it's just going to reject all your shares and never pay you. Uh, the whole point of the job negotiation protocol is that at least you know that your pool is censoring some transaction. Otherwise, you won't even know. Uh, so it's just more transparent. Yeah, 
That's cool. I have another question here from um, Andrew. Uh, he says, what are the prospects for better hash or some similar protocol? Is that even being worked on, I think? Well, better hash has been included in Stratum V2. So I think it will just remain like a piece of history. But other than that, we won't, we will never implement it because there's V2 now and it's just easier to implement. And I mean, Korolev himself worked on V2 to make something uh, which needs to be used. So I think it will just be a piece of history and uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it sounds like it's sort of been folded into the Stratum V2. Um, and then Anat asks, uh, are there any other mining pools that are showing interest in running V2, as far as you know? Honestly, at the moment, I don't know. Uh, I think they will in the future just because it's more efficient. So there are for the pools, uh, it, it makes sense for the pool to just run V2 because uh, they have less CPU load on the server side, for example. Uh, I don't know if they will run like the full V2 um, scenario with all the different, um, with all the four protocols. But I think that in the future, they will definitely start using the mining protocol because it, it just makes sense. It, it's easy to implement. It will be fully implemented. At the moment, I think, but again, not sure, that slash pool is the only one already having an endpoint for V2. But as soon as the code is completed and a bit robust, I really think that they will switch to V2. One question I had, sense. one question I had, Daniela, is you mentioned that if I understand correctly, is it possible that individual miners inside of a mining pool can signal what um, protocol they want to upgrade to? Yeah, uh, basically, it's like in this moment, uh, all the pools, or uh, I think most of them, are using the signaling bits to signal that they like taproot, for example. But what if a miner doesn't like taproot? In this uh, particular moment of the history, uh, it has to just uh, accept that the, the pool is uh, signaling taproot. But in a future with a job negotiation protocol, the miner could at least ask to the pool, hey, I don't like taproot. Can I signal against it? So. Uh, Signaling bits are used like they were using past for P2 stage, I think. So the whole point is that at least as a miner, you can ask your pool if the signaling bits you want to use are okay for for the pool. But then again, if your pool says no, I don't care, I want you to signal that you're okay with taproot, either you change the pool or you, you just have to do it otherwise the pool won't accept your shares that's incredible because i think prior to v2 um hash rate like the individual miners couldn't they didn't really have a choice or a decision they would just follow whatever the pool admin decided is that right yeah exactly and also it wasn't they um it wasn't even transparent because the whole point is if your pool decides that it doesn't like taproot, well, you have to comply or leave. But at least with a negotiation protocol, you will know that the pool doesn't like taproot and it's not fine with people with people signaling against taproot. Uh, so yeah, th that's the whole point, being more transparent. And, you know, as a miner, um, this thing improves decentralization because you can use your own hash rate to signal whatever you want, which is really cool. Wow. And so, um, I, so as an individual miner, I can include any transaction I want and then the pool admin just accepts it, right? Well, not exactly. Uh, either the admin accepts it or it says, hey, I don't like these transactions because blah, blah, blah. 
And the point is, if the pool doesn't like that transactions, there's not much I can do about it. I just have to remove it. But at least I'll know that this mining pool doesn't like this transaction because blah, blah, blah. And this means I can just go on Twitter and say, hey, this pool doesn't like this transaction because blah, blah, blah. And it's everything more transparent. Well, without a negotiation protocol, uh, the problem is that I will never know that the pool is censoring someone because I'm just receiving some transactions. I'm not even checking the mempool and uh, I just accept them. So the point is not um, that the pool will accept everything. The point is that I can at least kind of discuss with the pool, kind of ask to the pool if it's fine with, um, with some transactions or not. So it sounds like the uh, job negotiation is like pretty important, but have have there been instances in the past where uh, miners would do a whole bunch of work and then uh, the pool admin would just like not even would just completely ignore it, and miners would get like no explanation about like why, because because that sounds like it'd be like a waste for for the individual miners' perspective. Well, uh, that can't happen if you don't use the negotiation protocol. And it can't happen because um, you're just working on the template the pool is giving you. And if you don't use that template, it's, re it's a rejected share, but you already know. Um, if you use the job negotiation protocol, you don't start mining until um, you, um, you have uh, found consensus with the pool. So till the pool says, okay, I like this template, you don't start mining. What could happen is that, yes, your pool could say, hey, I like this template, and then reject all your shares. But in that case, you will notice in a couple of minutes, and you will just leave and find another pool. So, yeah. Got it. All right. Do uh, Does anybody else have any other questions for Daniela? Okay. Uh, wait, there's one question in the chat. Okay. I could read it. So it says V2 ultimately doesn't allow the individual miner to hand pick transactions to be included then. Well, it does, but then the miner needs to ask the pool if the pool likes those transactions. So yeah, as a miner, you can decide that you want to mine just some certain transactions, but you have to discuss a bit with the pool and make sure that uh, the pool is fine with the transactions you chose. And again, if it's if the pool tells you no, I don't like this transaction, you can you will at least know. You will have the opportunity to tell everyone that that pool is censoring some transactions and. You know, there's this transparency where you know what the pool is thinking of some transactions. Where without V2, you just don't know. You receive some transactions and you don't even know if some of them have been censored. So yeah, that's the main difference. As a pool, you can still uh, censor some transactions, but the miners will know and they will decide if they like you as a pool, maybe they will remain. If they don't, maybe they will just tell everyone and leave. So are you actually getting the transactions to include as a miner? Are you getting the transactions to include in your template from the pool or are you are potentially getting them from your own pool node to create your template? Well, you get them from your own node. So like I the so, yeah. scenario I saw before. Uh, um, yeah, so that's really where the sensor well, resistance comes in. You're making, a, you're making a template up based on the transactions you've seen on the network, and then you're pr proposing that to your pool, and your, po your pool then either accepts or rejects that selection of transactions. Yeah, exactly. That you... Okay, that's awesome. All right, Daniela. So should we move along? Yeah, Daniela, you did such a fantastic job presenting. Thank you so much for uh, uh, just spending time with us and breaking down how Stratum V2 works. Yeah, great presentation, super interesting. Um, thanks a lot.
again super sorry for what happened for the connection and everything but it's been fun right thanks a lot yeah no worries hey guys follow follow her on twitter she uh yeah we should boost her social media <laughs> yes. yeah i put the link i put the, um, I put the link on the meter page Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I won't follow with the seminar because I'm quite tired, but it's been really fun. Thanks. Okay. Well, take care, Daniela. Yeah. We'll Thank talk you. to you later. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye-bye.